Hi, I'm Jenny Wilson. I'm one of the co-curators of the International Festival of Consent and the founder of the International Day of Consent, which is the 30th of November. Um, one of the many roles I have, I'm a performer, I'm a, a producer and lots of other things, writer. Um, one of the amazing roles I have, I've been lucky enough to, to secure, is the role uh, in a freelance capacity as an activist in residence. With, uh, at Leeds Beckett University here in Yorkshire in the UK um, with the Stigmatised Sexualities and Sexual Harm Research Group who are part of the psychology department at Leeds, University, Leeds Beckett University. And so uh, I'm just starting out really in that role. I've been working with the group on and off for a, a couple of months and getting to know them. Um, and they, and three of them have very kindly agreed to join me today. Um, they are academic researchers, they're not performers like me, so they're being very brave taking part in a recorded session like this one. Um, and I, their invitation is to, is to share with us some of their thoughts about um, stigma and shame and how that impacts on their research and on how that, that research can impact on the world. Um, so that's what we're here for today. Um, thank you to the people who've, who've joined us um, on uh, the Zoom meeting, who are, are watching and listening to start with. Uh, we will open out the conversation to, um, to the rest of you and to encourage you to, to ask questions, to share your experiences too in a little while. Um, but the first thing I would like to do um, is introduce our three members of the Shush Research Group, um, and that's um, uh, Lauren, Cheska and Tamara. Um, so what I'd like you each to do, guys, if this is OK, um, is to uh, just say a little bit about who you are and the area of your research so that the people who are watching can understand the kind of research that you do. It, Tamara, just briefly though. So Tamara, would you mind starting and then we'll go to Cheska and then Lauren. Yeah, thanks Jenny. Uh, so I'm Tamara Turner-Moore. Uh, I'm a, a senior lecturer in psychology and uh, I lead the Shush Research Group. Uh, my research uh, essentially aims to understand and prevent sexual harm. So I'm interested in all forms of sexual harm, such as sexual violence, sexual abuse, sexual bullying and harassment, and against um, all people, whether it be against adults or young people or children. And so I'm interested in how we can prevent that sexual harm. And some of my research also looks more broadly at issues around sex and sexuality, uh, such as uh, sexual thoughts and fantasies, and stigmatised social practices. Thank you, Tamara. Cheska? Hello, my name is Cheska Taylor. Um, I'm actually a PhD student at Leeds Beckett. Um, Tamara is my supervisor. Um, I'm broadly interested in researching um, genders and sexualities and sexual harm. Um, and my current PhD project is um, looking at recipient experiences of online sperm donation. So um, the main study for that um, involves me interviewing um, recipients and recipient couples who are um, going online to find sperm donors um, and then conceiving sort of outside of the clinical um, medical structures. Um, so that usually involves self-insemination at home. Um, so I'm interested in the the recipient's connections with the donors um, and also just how they um, experienced that whole process from looking for the donor to conception and beyond. So it's a longitudinal study that I'm doing at the moment. Thank you, Cheska. Um, and uh, just to say, when we when we do uh, open it out to discussion, obviously I'm quite familiar with some of your work, all, all, all three of you, um, but you might need for the audience to explain what, what the issues are that, that have come up in your research, if you can. Um, and Lauren. Uh, hi, I'm Lauren Smith. I am a lecturer at Leeds Beckett University, um, and I've recently uh, finished my PhD. Um, that piece of research looked at how people make and communicate decisions about sexual consent following substance use 
Um, more broadly, I'm interested in how people um, make and communicate decisions about sexual consent and looking at sort of the broader um, socio-ecology. So how do, for example, wider um, macro level factors, so things like cultural values and norms uh, impact um, people's sexual consent sort of in and off the moment. Great, thank you. Um, I have a sore throat, so I apologize. <laughs> a drink or something there. Um, great, so that, that gives uh, our listeners a little bit of a sense of the kinds of areas of, of work that you're doing. Um, uh, Tamara, I wonder if I could start with you. Um, to say a, a little bit about um, how shame um, impacts on the kind of work that the Shush Group do and stigma. Yeah, thanks, Jenny. Yeah, well, I've been thinking about this quite a lot recently, and um, there's some work I'd really like to sort of share to maybe start off this conversation. And uh, it's some work by uh, Janice Irvine, who's a sociologist in the US. And she's done quite a lot of work around um, the challenges that researchers can face in undertaking research in sex and sexuality. And I think that maybe through uh, talking about some of her work, it might resonate with other people. Um, so I'd, I'd like to start with that. She talks about um, something called the speaker's burden and uh, how there is a stigma attached to researchers that have any visible connection to sex and that this stigma is essentially a burden to researchers who are trying to speak out um, and research these issues. And she also draws on this uh, idea which I think is quite interesting by someone else called Everett Hughes, um, this idea of dirty work and suggests that um, research into sex and sexuality, which is what she was focusing on, um, is an example of dirty work in inverted commas. It's a, a socially necessary job, um, but something that society marginalizes nonetheless. Um, you know, people tend to experience anger, uh, disgust, fear about the kinds of topics that we research. And that sometimes can be projected onto you as a researcher. Um, and I think there's a number of ways in which uh, that stigmatization of this kind of research can manifest. So we can look at that within the, our workplace, for example. Um, so there can be a lack of support from ethics committees around this kind of work. Um, Janice Irvine in her work, she did a, a survey of sociologists uh, who researched sex and sexuality in the US and 45% reported they'd experienced difficulties in getting ethical approval uh, with ethics committees either delaying or discouraging their research. Um, a quarter reported their students had experienced difficulty in getting ethical approval for sex and sexuality projects. And many noted how the amount of red tape, red tape involved was really discouraging. And it's really interesting because um, she draws on another person's work called Laura Stark, who um, observed ethics committees making their decisions. And what she found was that actually the, what she calls the visceral responses, you know, that, 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 those moments where you experience that fear or that anger or that disgust, well, that's what the ethics committee members experienced and that that actually often exerted a powerful influence on the decisions that the ethics committee made. Um, she also noted how ethics committees often treated researchers themselves as suspect because of their interest in doing this work um, and found that uh, researchers who did this work often mischaracterized themselves as perverts or sex crazed or even paedophiles. So there can be that lack of support from the ethics committee. There could also be a lack of support from your own colleagues. Um, in Irvine's survey, she reported uh, many stigmatizing experiences. Um, there's some interesting quotes from uh, participants there who said, no one at my university will even talk about the work. They seem to think it's shameful. Um, a lot of moral judgments being made about colleagues who did this kind of work. Um, one uh, said that a staff member refused to work with me on a course development because she believed the course was immoral. Um, so there can be a lack of support from colleagues. It could also be a lack of support more broadly institutionally. It might be that there's a, a non-welcoming climate at work. 
Um, in Irvine's survey, um, she found that one participant, for example, reported how my sexuality research is recognised but not valued, barely tolerated, not accepted. Um, and others commented on how there was subtle undercutting of uh, research students who did work in this area and a sense that although it was tolerated, it wasn't encouraged. And this could um, also be borne out in terms of um, more general institutionalized stigma, uh, for example, not receiving internal grants because of the kind of work that you do. Um, and uh, I think it was quite interesting that another participant said that they had received a message from their university saying, we do not wish to support research that will land the university on the front page of the newspaper. Um, so universities aren't always supportive of this kind of work either, um, and they don't always stand by their researchers if the researcher experiences conflict, for example, from the public or politicians or external funders. And what she noted was that actually to do this work well, what we need is support from institutions and typically where it works well is a strong institutional commitment to academic freedom and to freedom of speech. But beyond our workplaces, there's also um, the issues of how we are, how the, our work is received um, by acquaintances and also sometimes fear of public reprisals as well. Um, and this can play out in lots of different ways. It might be that, for example, you think about uh, you might meet friends of friends and they simply just ask what you do. Um, and sometimes there can be a sense that actually you're disclosing what you do rather than sharing what you do. Um, and there can sometimes be fears that your work or you will be targeted on social media or via email. Obviously, our st staff profiles and our contact details are all out there. Um, so I think there's a lot of ways in which it, it can affect us. Um, but I think it's important to recognise that some of the impacts that that can have too. So, you know, in undertaking this research around sex and sexuality or sexual harm, we can experience stigma from our colleagues institutions, acquaintances, and wider public because they think this research is shameful. And I think that when we're shamed by others for doing this work, it's only a short step to feeling ashamed of ourselves in undertaking it. And I think there's also other personal impacts. Um, I've noticed, for example, that sometimes it can be, there's quite a wearing impact sometimes of having to think constantly, uh, very carefully about how to phrase your research because it is stigmatized. So that can, that can be quite tiring. Um, and it has wider impacts too. So the stigma attached to this research impacts on what knowledge can be produced in relation to sex and sexuality and sexual harm, where universities and ethics committees act as gatekeepers to that knowledge, shaping and constraining what is possible. I think that's all I want to say for now, but hopefully that helps. Thank you. Sorry, I had a bit of a technical issue there. Thank you, uh, Tamara. That's a really um, useful provocation that sort of outlines a lot of the broad issues that we are going to um, touch on today, I'm sure. Um, and some really great um, reference points there about the dirty work. Um, so um, just for there's a couple of latecomers of, who've arrived um, to to listen in on the Zoom, just to ask you guys, please, to keep your cameras and sound off until I invite you to join the rest of us and to let you know that this session is being recorded. Um, so um, first things first, I think it would be helpful if we had a little bit of a chat about what we mean by shame and stigma. What is that? Um, and the definition that I've, I'm working from a lot when I'm working around shame at the moment is Brené Brown's definition, which is that shame is the intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love, belonging and connection. Just let that sit for a minute. So shame is the intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love, belonging or connection. So um, I like that definition of shame because it um, 
it defines it intent it, 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 it is a feeling and it is an experience like all feelings they're felt in the body they're the physical reaction um and that it comes from this sense that we've done something wrong that we've made a mistake that we, there's a flaw somewhere that we've got it wrong and that that means that we're going to be um disenfranchised from something through, removed from the group um thrown out and, and anyone um any of you want to sort of offer any any thoughts about shame or stigma and how you're defining it or how you're experiencing and feeling it group okay <laughs> um just thinking about sort of Tamara's provocation there and then and the Brenny Brown definition around sort of belonging and family and the sort of shame that you might carry around your work and um how you describe the work you do and how that might impact on sort of your relationship with with your family and friends if you know I've definitely done it where I've found it quite difficult to bluntly say this is the research I do and it surrounds sex and drugs and consent and to have you know those conversations with family members at time has really felt quite disconnecting and and shameful and and that sense of belonging feels almost uh, quite hard to to um to to interact with I think mm. yeah yeah let's go any thoughts about how you're how you're defining or feeling or experiencing shame yeah just in relation to what Lauren said I my family don't really ask me about my research and I've just thought about that and I think it's a combination of them thinking oh it's academia it's something else that we don't do they're not academics they didn't go to university um and so there's a part of that but the other part of it I think is the fact that it is around something that they see is so obscure and mm -hmm. strange and when I tell anyone that I'm researching online sperm donation they're like what is that we don't even know what that means and then I have to go into more detail and then you can kind of see their eyes glazing over maybe they wish they didn't ask um and that's not a nice feeling I think there's that brings up feelings of shame not quite in the same way as Brené Brown described like I sort of conceptualize it as more of a spectrum so where those feelings of discomfort and embarrassment start at the sort of beginnings of that then intense feeling of shame and, and sadness mm -hmm. that's how I sort of conceptualize it at the moment anyway <laughs> um, uh, certainly um, although I'm not an academic experience those things around my work as well I was having a conversation with my mother yesterday who who uh, I'm, I'm doing a lot of talking on social media on Facebook and she's a friend of mine on Facebook at the moment about consent and she said I'm, I'm not I'm not reading your posts about your your work at the moment I don't understand it I don't I, it's not for me and I it's said it's not for me it's not, it's not for my mum apparently um, <laughs> which of course is is that and it is that um um uh, a, a, li a lying of of consent with sex and sex with shame that is the is the challenge there um because consent is something that my daughter who's nine understands fully um and thoroughly um but we don't talk a lot she knows what sex is but we she you know she has an age appropriate understanding of what that is so consent isn't about shame i did a long rant the other day on facebook about the about consent at the dentist so uh, it is for everyone and it is for all the time um but yeah online sperm donation isn't for everyone and it isn't for all the time and neither is um substance abuse and sex um, or in, um and also thinking about some of the other areas that members of the group are researching um i know um it was a shame that she wasn't it was a shame <laughs> uh that she wasn't able to join us but um uh in prep for this session we had a, a a long chat with Lindsay who is researching around it is Lindsay isn't it who's researching around um men who abuse children um and her her research into that is it obviously is very valuable because we don't understand what's going on for those potential the, those people who are potentially going to harm children 
then how do we begin to tackle that issue? Um, but that is a very very problematic area to talk about in, in uh, over over dinner. Um, <laughs> it's fine in a geeky set. It's a shame research group, but it's not everywhere. So, yeah. Tamara, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, I, I was just going to say that I think um, I think part of the difficulty is that sometimes some of the work that we do takes a bit of explaining. And there isn't, you know, not every context is the right context or you have enough time to do that. Um, so I think that can be more challenging. Um, I think perhaps when we do work around people who experience sexual harm, people understand the value of that. Um, they don't always uh, like it. They still don't necessarily want to talk about it. Um, and uh, it it's, it can still uh, result in kind of researchers feeling perhaps that they're doing something that maybe they shouldn't do in some way. I think sometimes that can still happen. I think when people research those who engage in sexual harm, there's an extra level of explaining that sometimes you feel you have to do or that you need to do. Um, it's, you know, perhaps harder still to understand why that research would be done um, and so I think often that means that you're looking for the right opportunities uh, to talk about that um, and to be able to explain how that work contributes to preventing sexual harm and how vital it is um, to stopping sexual harm from happening either in the first time or again in the future um, but I think there is perhaps extra stigma there related to that kind of work. Mm. Mm. Yes, and it's that wonderful phrase that I first heard talking to you guys of, of courtesy stigma. So it's that secondhand stigma of researching in, in an area that is stigmatised rather than it actually being your own, mm. um, your own shame, taking on other people's. I know yeah. Lindsay was talking about, for example, um, in order to do her research, she has to form a relation, form a, a, a healthy dialogue relationship, win the trust mm -hmm. of these men who have potentially or actually caused sexual harm, and that's it. That people aren't simply reduced to that's all they are. They are multi multifaceted mm -hmm. human beings who aren't just some monster that that that's part of that's the behaviour that they may have engaged in. Um. Just going back, just stepping back a little bit from um, moving forward, it just what shame isn't um, and, and where shame is useful is a, is something that, that might be useful to just bounce around a little bit. Right. Shame is, is when we're in shame as opposed to, for example, embarrassment or guilt or feeling responsible or accountable, um, actual actually in shame it's like a tra it's like a traumatic place when you're, in, when you're not thinking rationally you're you're in fight flight type of behavior do, do you see those distinctions as well anyone yeah sorry i i paused because i thought cheska was about to speak were you about to speak cheska no okay mm -hmm. um yeah i i think that the i think that Shame possibly can be motivating, but I think maybe in relatively limited circumstances. Um, I think the way that I often understand shame is really around um, a judgment being made on the, an internal judgment being made um, within that person. And uh, particularly around this idea of um, that person potentially being a bad person, I think. Um, and I think that can be really limiting. It uh, limits our ideas that we can change or that other people can change, um, which I think is quite distinct from feeling guilt, where in those instances, I think it's more about feeling like you've done a bad thing. Um, it's a, the focus is on the behaviour um, rather than on the person. Um, and I think if we are looking to change in some way and to grow or to transform then I think that 
it's important to be able to say, okay, I've done something wrong and I'm going to address that as opposed to I am wrong. Well, how could I fix that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, I think shame from like when I conceptualize it and think about, I think about being shamed and it's really crippling the thought of, of perhaps trying to be accountable, but fearing that you will be shamed for that is a really sort of crippling feeling. I think, um, that perhaps prevents you from actually holding yourself accountable for something or for, for sort of engaging in a meaningful like change or dialogue. Yeah, I think that point about accountability is important. You know, if, if you believe that it's something inherently wrong in you, mm-hmm. that is the issue, um, then it's kind of like, well, what can I do about it? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. mm. <laughs> uh, whereas, um, you know, if you recognise you've done something wrong, then perhaps that's a different process where you can say, OK, I need to hold myself accountable for that behaviour mm-hmm. and see how I can act differently going mm-hmm. forward. Mm. Yes, um, which is why uh, Brené Brown does a th- says that um, shame is not a tool for social justice. I would say shame is perhaps not a tool for justice of any kind, actually. Um, but um, but responsibility and accountability are, um, and that's that's an important distinction when we shame or when we are shaming of people and we put them in the shame box and say you're a thing. Um, and fix that person in they are a monster they are a bad person it's very difficult then for them to actually change um we'll come maybe back onto that in a little while around maybe have a little bit of a chat around the criminal justice system and how that works but um uh to stick to my sort of agenda for today um particularly Cheska and and Lauren how is how has shame specifically impacted on your work personally or professionally sure I guess um I think uh, like I mentioned before um that that shame of discussing my work beyond the realms of basically our research group which is actually a really sort of liberating thing and space to have where we can discuss things um it also relates a lot to my actual participants um and again I think we touched on it before but it's that notion of being shamed for being different and all of the things we research are different and distinct and that's kind of why we research them so I've been thinking a bit about the fact that we research things makes them not I don't know how to explain it but the fact that we research things makes them well we research things because they are stigmatized but there is a risk that in doing that we kind of prefer the stigmatizing so we have to do our research in the right way so as not to make our participants feel like they need to be researched there's a reason there's something Mm -hmm. wrong with them or the things that they do um yeah so specifically with my participants a lot of them are um single women and same-sex couples who can't access um sperm donation in like clinical routes and so have undertaken this other route which is actually when you look at it from a different perspective, a really sort of freeing practice because those institutions aren't there. Um, they can kind of make their own rules, but there are obviously issues within that too. Um, but yeah, I think it's really important for me to make sure that they don't feel like what they're doing is something seedy or shameful. Mm-hmm. It's actually a really amazing thing that they're doing, planning families outside of these traditional binary heteronormative structures um yeah so I've been thinking a lot about that recently (laughs) yes so yes so there's a lot around um how shame and stigma affects the people that you are trying to research and actually accessing those people can be quite difficult can't it because because those they, they are underground hidden away places where those things happen yeah absolutely yeah, it can be really hard to 
yeah, to, to access them. They're sort of defined, I guess, as hard to reach populations, which is a stigmatizing concept in itself. These people exist. We find them hard to reach because we're researchers and they kind of maybe don't want us to reach them because it means that they're a sort of subject to be studied. Um, so it's, yeah, approaching the research in ways that is like emancipatory for them, sort of, okay, if I take part in this research, what what am I doing for my community? And yeah, I guess the sort of methods that you use really affect um, that. The approach that you take, the methods you use really have a powerful impact on how your participants see themselves and the direction of the research, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, lots of nods of agreement there. <laughs> Say a bit maybe about how how that's um, how it's affected your work and along the way. Yeah, I am. Um, so obviously, my research surrounds um, <clears throat> sex and substances, which I think that at best is seen as risky, and at worst is associated with sexual violence and danger. Um, and I think that one of the things that I've been kind of up against or feel like I've carried a level of shame with is actually kind of making the statement that people are having sex that they enjoy, that is consensual, that is pleasurable after they've been drinking or taking drugs. And I think that that's been shame that or concerns that I've had saying that to other researchers that study consent and drug taking. It's been um, you know, people that are involved in <clears throat> setting the sort of zero tolerance to sex and drugs on, on university campuses, for example. Um, and that's something that I've been definitely like, I've held a sort of concern and, and some shame around saying that people are having these pleasurable consensual sexual experiences. And actually, those are things that we can learn from. We, you know, we can build better prevention by looking at those experiences. And it's taken sort of the entirety of my PhD to be able <laughs> to confidently sort of say, you know, people are having these experiences and they're not always risky or dangerous. And I think from my perspective, by me being worried to say that, it's just further added to this idea that it happens in the shadows and it is dangerous and we shouldn't talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think, you know, just from thinking about psychology's position, particularly, around issues of sex and substances, I think that we've done a, a massive disservice by positioning, you know, sex and drugs um, as deviant and immoral and um, a kind of echo in what Cheska is saying. I think that it's really great to be part of a group. And I feel like um, I feel like Tamara will probably agree where actually we are working to actively undo some of that shame and stigma that our our um, discipline has has contributed to, I think. Um, and I, I know that so, some people that within the group will say, you know, oh, when I say that I'm in psychology, I feel like I even have to so, sort of undo that and say, you know, but I'm not that sort of psychology. <laughs> um, so it's nice to be part of a group that is trying to undo that. But it's definitely taken me a long time to be able to say, you know, yes, pleasure and, and consent and it's not risky and it's not deviant. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think one of the, the things that uh, I thought of as well while you were speaking, Lauren, was how um, how there is a kind of a higher bar or a different expectation around our work. And I'm thinking more about the work around um, sex and sexuality now rather than sexual harm mm -hmm. is this idea that um, it's only worthy of study if it is something if we're looking at something that is wrong or problematic mm -hmm. um that it's it's not something that's worthy of study if we are interested in looking at something that people enjoy yeah and, um, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. then, uh, suddenly that's considered uh more immoral and mm -hmm. something that uh, is frivolous in some way mm -hmm. it's yeah i think like sort of over the the past year or so becoming more interested in primary prevention of sexual harm has kind of allowed me to see that that you can sort of like 
people don't want to hear that you're researching pleasure, sex and pleasure for the sake of it. So if you can sell it as this is a form of preventing sexual harm, <laughs> um, it almost gives you a sort of way in to, to, to begin to have those conversations with people in a way that they are, you know, on board with. Um, oh, yes, this is meaningful work. It's reducing harm. <laughs> yes. And of course, it is serving both of those people. Yeah, yeah. But you're absolutely right. Sometimes it that is the way in, perhaps, to having those kinds of conversations. It gives it legitimizes the research in those people's eyes. Yeah. Sorry. Oh no! Carry on, Tesca, please. I was just going to say we've spoken like a few times about um, yeah, making your research more palatable, like the language that you use. Um, what do you research? You could just say sexual violence and then that kind of for a lot of people that's like okay I know what that is I can conceive that and I'm happy I'm satisfied no more questions people don't usually say what kind of sexual violence mm. um so yeah it's yeah it's that language of like or uh, just psychology yeah you can just make make it what what you want to present it as mm. people without having to maybe feel shame um yeah you can dodge those feelings but then it's also the question of if you want to I, mm. I don't know do you want to stand up for the research that you do and really explain it when's the right situation when isn't um yeah mm. I think that's a hard like balancing act yeah when's the right situation and when's the right audience I had a really yeah. powerful experience once where I was um traveling to the U.S. for a conference to <laughs> spent some work on sexual harm <laughs> and um, <laughs> when I got to uh, the other end in the US and the um, I was going through the sort of customs and all of that and uh, you know they were asking everyone what they were doing and I said oh yeah no, I'm here on business it's like okay what kind of business it's like oh I'm here for conference well what kind of conference it's like um well it's a it's a conference around sexual violence okay well, what what in relation to sexual violence <laughs> and um uh, uh, and I just I didn't want to have that conversation right then you know with a with a whole queue of people behind me <laughs> and I also felt like the level of interrogation seemed to be uh deeper than perhaps was for other people who were in the queue and um but my apparent evasiveness then set off alarm bells for them and um and I was uh, randomly selected <laughs> for further questioning um, and for them to go through all of my luggage. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think uh, it can be really difficult sometimes to know uh, when is the best time to stay quiet, when is the best time to say more um, and when the right audience there, you know, what the right audience is for that. Mm. Mm. So um, I, I'm going to assume that the audience that's in this Zoom room and the audience that decide to watch this recording later are the right audience. Um, and I'm going to invite each of you now to um, say if you were completely shameless about your work and you are really, really proud of it uh, and what it what you what you do and what you achieve. What would you like to 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 say if you could remove shame from from it? What what would what would you say? What would you do differently? What would that mean? Who's going first? <laughs> no one's going to go first. I'll go first. <laughs> um, I would say. I think I would say that you know my research is looking at how people make and communicate decisions when they're drunk and high and that involves the experiences in, that are harmless that are pleasurable that are fun and understanding those and 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 giving voice to those stories is important in and of itself it's part of human behavior but also it can help us to prevent harm in the future because if we can build the context that are associated with pleasure consent fun like you know woohoo close off here we go then we can hopefully learn about how to teach people about how to be in those contexts and have those types of experiences and communicate 
without shame uh, themselves. I think I'm just going to respond because I think it's so important, and I think that we live in such a, a, a culture of entitlement and uh, coercion, and it's so hard for people to say no. And I think one of the most harmful things is um, shame around sex because especially people who are socialized as girls are taught that it's something that they should resist mm -hmm. and might might not be very nice and that they should stop other people from having taking this thing from mm -hmm. and, and that belief means that they accept harm because they're expecting it whereas if they came at it going I should be having fun I'm not having fun mm -hmm. I want to stop now yeah how much harm that uh, that could stop just there's just yeah there's just so much of the narrative is around avoiding risk mm. rather than you know pleasure and excitement and and enjoyment and i think that you know if we're going to move to a place where we can have conversations that are open and 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 ethical and be able to communicate in a way that that is sort of meaningful um, then we have to build people's confidence to say what they want. Um, like, you know, this is what I desire and this is what I like, as opposed to, as opposed to, yeah, like praising sort of restraint and conformity. It's, it, they don't marry for me, I don't think. How can you be kind of unashamed and, and at the same time be expected to be completely restrained and, and yeah, they don't marry. I don't think for me this. Yeah, and and navigating the complexities of consent when you are, it, when you are in, intoxicated in mm. way and your judgment is affected by, yeah. by a drug or alcohol. Yeah, what to have those conversations because otherwise people are going mm. to experience harm. And yeah, and you see you see within the in some of the research as well, particularly around you know if we think about sort of alcohol and drug taken you know in this country at least our sex education has only just been made something that is compulsory that's worth you know teaching everyone mm -hmm. there is like no provision to even begin teaching people about what it means to have the capacity or how to have conversations with someone when they're intoxicated or the importance of perhaps you know setting boundaries or having mm -hmm. settings in which there are bystanders around that can monitor these types of things you know like we see in sort of like play bdsm settings there's there are pockets and communities of people that you know practice harm reduction in the context of intoxication and sex in the context of of other ways of um perhaps not being able to verbalize in the moment we know that we know that those practices can be harmless actually and they are enjoy they are enjoyed by people um but what we're not doing is sort of having those conversations with people um we say you know go out and get wasted and feel confident and we also don't teach people about <laughs> about sort of how to navigate what it means to to have have a sexual conversation with someone um so it's yeah there's just so much work that needs to be done <laughs> thank you thank you for, for the for accepting my invitation to be shameless for a minute <laughs> um Kirsty, Tamara, do either of you want to respond to that shamelessness <laughs> Shamelessness. Yeah, I think uh, for me, I guess I've been thinking about this in terms of perhaps not my individual work, but more broadly, maybe the future I'd like to see. I don't know if that's a little bit uh, too ambitious, but okay. you know, I, I think that both um, Cheska and Lauren have talked about the support and connection that we feel through the Shush group. And, you know, and I feel that too, and I'm so grateful for, you know, the research students that I work with and the colleagues that I work with in that group. And, and you know, it's amazing to have that. Um, but I also feel a bit sad that we have to comment on that as if it is something unusual or unique. You know, it's, it, it, I would like to see a future where actually this work was, just accepted and supported broadly 
not just within our group, but across you know, our, our subject area, across our institution, across society. Um, you know, I'd like to see people recognizing not only that it's socially necessary, but that it shouldn't be marginalized and it shouldn't be stigmatized. Um, so I think building connections, I suppose, is important and people and and as a society getting to a place where we realize that actually this is something that should be recognized and celebrated rather than just simply tolerated i think is important thank you jessica do you want to say anything about about your area of work and being shameless yeah, yeah similar to what Tamara said about um like futures exciting and positive futures I think in the work I'm doing at the moment I've had a tendency to lean towards okay how can we um get equal access to services that exist that's been my sort of focus the first half of my PhD and now I'm thinking yeah of course we need the access material resources and access and equality but thinking beyond that um into the future that I can't really imagine. Um, I don't know, there's something really amazingly positive about online sperm donation. And like I said before, this sort of um, community that's been created free of like oppressive institutions. Um, and I think that is something to, to look forward to is yeah, what would the world look like if these sort of stigmas and that are sort of caused by inaccess to certain sects of society if those didn't exist um yeah that that would be a shameless world for me if people were yeah free of even just the sort of um concept of being gendered and I don't know specifically for for my participants it's about like different sorts of family formations that are uh, that are not a part of the sort of like neoliberal nuclear family like is there a way of imagining um fam like more communal family structures and ways of caring um that are outside of that like fixed mm -hmm. um like mom dad heteronormative couple parenting because we know that 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 is harmful um, in many ways, the sort of individualism um, and what that means like later down the line. Um, yeah, so I think it, yeah, it's looking towards those futures of something completely different that's really, really hard to envision because we've never seen it before, not in our lifetimes anyway, but there, there are cultures in the world that have done that and so it's been a really successful, um, yeah, so it would be thinking about those sorts of possibilities beyond simple material like policy change etc yeah um, it would open up your work would open up a whole um range of um redefinitions of what a family looks like couldn't it um exactly yeah you know, um because a lot of the people that are, that are in your research are, are same-sex couples individuals perhaps poly even people or you know different different parenting dynamics that don't look at all like a, a, a traditional nuclear family yeah exactly and that's really exciting and it shouldn't be like okay well actually what we want is access to this service so that we can parent our children in the same way as everyone else always has mm. um yeah so i think that's that's what's exciting and unshameful for me when I imagine the future. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I, I think um, now might be a good time to begin to open up to the rest of the people on this Zoom chat who've been listening very patiently for nearly an hour um, and um, invite you to um, 
uh, unmute if you wish to um, and un, uh, and uh, become uh, switch your camera on if you would like to. Um, we can see your lovely faces um, and uh, to, to offer us any reflections, questions, challenges or thoughts around the things that you've been hearing from the Shush group this morning. Um, I'm going to take the fact that um, Julia has switched on her camera <laughs> to to indicate that perhaps you might have something to say, Julia. Anything? No. Okay. It just it's just nice to see your face. <laughs> okay. It, um, so, shame. Anyone want to? Um, want to, <laughs> you can put your camera back on if you'd like to. Does anyone want to um, uh, explore? how how you're reflecting on shame and how that impacts on sexuality and stigma um is anyone there a researcher too or um are you just curious about research you can you can offer us anything otherwise we'll just keep chatting amongst ourselves <laughs> okay i guess people could also put questions in the chat they wanted maybe if That's a good idea, yeah. So anyone who's feeling a bit uncomfortable about um, being recorded and uh, seen online, um, you, you can type a question into the chat at this point and, um, and I will read those out um, as much as I can. Um, I think I saw someone someone appear then for a minute. Was it a Eva? Ava? Did you have a question or a point for us? Ah, uh, okay, she forgot the recording. Do you have a question? Maybe you could type for us. <laughs> no, okay. Um, oh, hello. Lynn, hello. Hello. Um, I was just curious. I am not a researcher in any sort of sexual harm, sexuality, or sexual practice field, but I would be curious about how you guys sort of got into that field and how you overcame any problems um, getting there, because that's like end goals for me. Okay, so how did you get into it, guys? Anyone? Thank you. I can speak a little bit about my own experience. Um, I, for me, I um, I guess uh, I so I did an undergraduate degree in psychology, and I suppose my final year dissertation was probably an opportunity to start to engage with some of the things that I was interested in, and I had a supervisor who was open to that, um, and. Uh, and it was, in fact, the only reason why I ended up going into staying in academia rather than going into practice, which is what I had originally intended, um, was because that supervisor was like, well, why don't you go on and do some more research on this? <laughs> and I was like, oh, yeah, actually, I'd, I'd like that. <laughs> um, so I think for me, it was a case of finding someone who supports you in that. And I think what's quite interesting is that... Um, in Janice Irvine's work that I was talking about earlier, um, she talks about how a lot of grad students um, said that uh, it was a similar kind of thing, finding someone who uh, supported that work, who recognised that work. Um, and you know, it also meant that sometimes there wasn't necessarily the, the particular training that you want that's uh, maybe uh, tailored to your kind of interests and area, and maybe that might not necessarily be well supported. So sometimes you might have to find that elsewhere. Um, so it's often about bringing the right people together, I think. Um, and that might be that you find one person in your particular university who really, you know, supports that work. And then you might even find someone from another institution who's perhaps happy to also work alongside you on that project. So I think for me going, after after my studying and now it's about finding people to collaborate with who are similar minded and excited about the same things thank you 
um, a question. How do you reach those more underground subjects, the, the ones that are harder to reach? Um, I'm guessing also sometimes that's ones who are perhaps outside the law. Um, you know, um, how, how do you find the drug taking sex, sex fiends and the... <laughs> I'd say with great difficulty. Um, I think one of the things that can help is if you're a part of that community. Um, yeah, that it's about establishing a level of trust. Um, quite often, more underground populations are really wary of being researched because of mm. bad experiences before where they've been presented in a light that isn't quite right. Um, so, yeah, it's about yeah of how you approach the research again um yeah and being a part of that community can be really helpful um yeah on using like online networks so especially with my research which is all online and um, getting access to like sort of gatekeepers so a lot of the um sperm donation groups are on facebook um, and there's other websites as well, so sort of getting in touch with the people who run those, um, and they can really help you to get access to the people who, um, who are part of that community. But yeah, it's people people seeing your sort of adverts, I guess, on those bases and actively making the decision to contact you is really really important. If there's any sort of um, like. time when uh, I don't know where people can feel so for instance with the online sperm donation stuff the sperm donors are quite often the gatekeepers of that community they run a lot of the websites and a lot of the Facebook groups and I've contacted them before and asked can I post something on your page and people can contact me and they've said for instance oh well I have a few recipients I can put you I can get them to contact you and that is a coercive sort of way of them saying okay well these are my recipients they'll tell you exactly how it is kind of on their terms and that's really dangerous and you want to avoid that um so yeah it's making sure that people are empowered to want to take part in the research themselves um, there's a few different ways but being a part of the community can be really really helpful um yeah to get the trust sort of reflecting how how being on the outside of that community can actually prevent as well like doing sort of sex and drug work I tried to recruit at Leeds Pride once so sort of as myself you know speaking to people and and I did have someone say to me like oh you're not one of those chemsex type researchers are you and I think that really for me highlighted how actually it, it is important to build community level contacts because if you don't people can only see you as the type of researcher that, that have historically represented that area. And um, so it, I think that like, I didn't do the work perhaps that Cheska's done and that's reflected in some of the, the fact that people didn't choose to actually take part. And that's something I've had to reflect on. And I think that we all sort of do in, in our research journeys, it's like, how do we reflect on the mistakes that we've made perhaps by not engaging with communities in the right way? Um, and that's that's definitely part of my journey sort of looking at okay what what did i do wrong in in that way what did i assume or how was i entitled enough to think that i could just sort of recruit you know populations um and yeah community level stuff i think is sort of key key to that in the future i think uh, alongside that lauren i feel like maybe you're giving yourself a little bit of hard <laughs> time um, I think that, um, yeah, absolutely. I think there are all of those things to consider and I completely agree that building trust in the community that you wish to research is vital. Um, I think also though, recognizing that this takes time mm. um, and it's something that has to be built on over time. And I think, and more so I think for the kind of research that we do than if you're doing something that is not stigmatized. And uh, so I think you have that on one hand, but then that's in tension with uh, someone trying to do a research degree within a set three or four year period. 
So I think, you know, research students and indeed researchers who are often on, you know, funded projects again for a set amount of time, there is that tension between needing to get data in inverted commas um, and really trying to build up the trust um, with the community that you're researching and to work alongside them to do research that is of benefit to them. Um, the supplement, supplementary question, which is about what about accessing subjects which are actually isolated from the communities? I just want to offer this, which is um, having spoken with, for example, Lindsay, who's who's researching men who have her, her, she first described her research area to me as men who have sexual thoughts about children, but have no intention of acting on those thoughts. Now, how the hell do you find those men? The only way to find them really is through the criminal justice system. So there are people who've already had some kind of brush with the law in terms of perhaps having images on a computer or those kinds of things. So they are now inside the criminal justice system. They are probably experiencing massive amounts of shame and stigma, um, rightly or wrongly, because of what they've done and feeling like they're a monster because because this because the, the world would would uh, would define them that way and so it you you it's actually impossible to access the person who's had the thought but that there's no way to find them and so i guess there's there are maybe some limitations about what's possible in research yeah uh, i think so some of that work, yeah, I think can be possible. I've done some of that work myself and I think it's really difficult. You can't necessarily uh, build trust in that community and it also assumes there is a community, um, which I think perhaps uh, is probably not what the, the question in the chat was alluding to, but it is, is related to that, um, mm -hmm. you know, that sometimes you are not trying to find a community of people um, you're trying to find a disparate range of people <laughs> and and that can be really hard and I think my experience with that has mostly been that it's important to offer people anonymity in the research um, people need to know that uh, your research is legitimate, um, that uh, it is supported by the university and that you're a respected academic, um, so that they have faith in your research and have faith in what you're going to do with it. They also need anonymity in order to feel sufficiently confident to come forward and talk about their thoughts and feelings. Um, but even then, not everyone will, uh, but it it begins to give you some of those insights. Uh, and I think potentially sometimes through doing that initial work and people seeing that work, it can give people confidence to maybe next time think, oh, actually I would do an interview with that particular individual. Um, I sometimes think it's a little bit like uh, how I can sometimes feel about engaging with the media. <laughs> you know, is it, you kind of think, oh, you know, I have mixed feelings about that. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, sometimes it can go either way. But you might develop a particular relationship with a particular journalist who you think actually they do this, that, you know, I like the, the pieces of journalism that they write. Uh, you know, I respect what they think and what they do. I feel like uh, I could trust them with my thoughts on this and the piece that they would write. And I guess you, as a researcher, you're aiming to do a similar kind of thing. Thank you. Um, another question from the chat is any advice on how to overcome challenges with ethics committees regarding research on consent? Lauren smiling. <laughs> It'd be prepared to write a lot. <laughs> um, no, I'm smiling just because it was taking me back to the length of my ethics application. Um, yeah, that's such a loaded question. I'm going to have to just sort of have a think. Yeah, as an indicator, Lauren, I'm mm. trying to remember now, but how long, how, how long was your and Cheska's ethics applications, do you think? 
probably about 10,000 words mine was yeah about 10,000 yeah yeah I think, um, I think many, a lot many appendices mm. um, I guess it's just yeah yeah spend a lot of time on it have your back covered on every single thing so they can't question it and again yeah having support from your supervisors mm. to do that because they've been through it before and they know if your supervisor has done this research before um yeah I think really sort of one of the things that I know that I did when I first did my ethics application was about sort of setting the the broader research context like so I drew a lot on sort of what do for example um or how do survivors of sexual violence talk about taking part in that research as empowering for example because I think a lot of the time ethics committees can see and I think this is reflecting what Tamara said kind of right at the start um that your peers don't necessarily see your work as uh, empowering or <laughs> um as as the positive uh the, the positive side of it so i think really highlighting what can be gained from it and if there are empowering elements to it and you know i remember comparing um there was a study that found that you know actually survivors of sexual violence took part in a very sort of boring study about throwing that they found to be mundane and <laughs> and they reported it as like oh it took quite a lot of time and then and then they reflected back on taking part in the other research and um, which they they said that they enjoyed and they felt like their story had been told and they, they they were able to like reflect on it and that was something that highlighted in my ethics application you know all research taking part in it might have negative outcomes it might have some degree of you know fatigue effects boredom effects whatever those might be um and it doesn't yeah you you kind of have to showcase to them that it's not going to necessarily result in this sort of doom and gloom world that they think it will yeah I completely agree with you Lauren I think that because unfortunately it, some of the things that we research are terrible things that have happened and um, there is an assumption that uh, it automatically means that people will find participating in it distressing mm. and wholly negative and uh, so I think it's really important to highlight the benefits of the research not just broadly um, but also potentially to the individuals involved mm. I think if you can draw on anything that you have that will help you with that maybe some pilot work I'm thinking for example with um uh, Cheska's PhD then um, another student had done some work which showed that actually uh, people enjoyed talking about their experiences and were, and were very forthcoming about them and actually wanted the opportunity to be heard mm. uh, and uh, so uh, are you know does the ethics committee really want to deny them that voice <laughs> um, and I think being able to draw on research that supports those points is really helpful. I know Lauren has talked about one of those studies, um, but there, you know, there are absolutely studies where they've um, asked people uh, about a whole range of potentially very sensitive or intrusive topics and asked them actually, how did you feel about being asked about those things? And it wasn't anywhere near as intrusive or distressing as we as researchers or perhaps as ethics committee members might have actually anticipated. I think there's also, um, it could also be really helpful if you can demonstrate there's a precedence for doing what, you, what you've done. You know, are there other people who have done the kinds of research that you are doing? Because if they have, and they're an academic institution, that will have got ethical approval. Um, so someone somewhere thinks that research is ethical. Um, and I think that you could demonstrating that precedence and maybe even getting in touch with those researchers if you're having a particularly difficult time, I think can be really helpful. And people are often really keen to support each other and reach out to each other in those kinds of circumstances. Thank you. Um, we've got no more questions in the chat. Um, I'm just thinking um, when we were talking before, before we wind up, we were talking a bit in preparation for this session. Some issues came up around um, the thing we were talking about earlier around shame. I said shame is not a tool for justice, not only social justice, but for any kind of justice. Um, now, I'm going to give you give you that question in terms of dealing with sort of stigma and sexual harm. When we when we rub up against the criminal justice system, 
is it working? Is it not working? Uh, I, I know that for a lot of you, your, find, your research is finding it's not working. What, yeah, I wanted to just throw that area open and see, see what, if any of you've got anything to offer around shame and justice specifically to I'm rambling shame and justice <laughs> okay. I'm just holding back in case either Lauren or Cheska wanted to no go ahead okay <laughs> like go ahead <laughs> um yeah I I I think that in our society we tend to uh see shame and justice as going hand in hand. Indeed, I think sometimes we think that shaming someone is justice. <laughs> um, but I'm a little bit hesitant around that. I'm not sure that shaming someone produces the change that maybe we want to see. I think that shaming is often used as a form of punishment um, and I think it's sometimes understandable why we might want to punish someone. Um, but I don't think that that shame helps with achieving justice. And I guess it obviously it does depend on what your conceptualization of justice is. And you might feel that punishment is is an important part of justice. I think for me, um, justice is about uh, seeing people who have done harm recognizing and being accountable for the harm that, that they have perpetrated. Um, and I think that sh shaming them is probably not going to open up that conversation or that possibility of them openly taking accountability for what they've done. So I think for me, it, it does raise questions around what can be achieved within the so-called criminal justice system. Um, I think that the criminal justice system tends to centre around punishment and around shame and punishment. You know, it's about proclaiming guilt over, and then uh, if someone's guilty or not guilty and then they serve time and then irrespective of what change really has occurred at the end of that, their time is done and, and we're supposed to move on. But I think really what would be more helpful is to center the person who's experienced the harm and their needs and to work with the person who's done the harm to hopefully reach a place where they feel able to take accountability and want to change and to me i'm not sure that shame uh, has a very positive role in that process yeah. Um, I, I just want to offer a reflection that was nowhere near the criminal justice system, thankfully, but someone that I'm close to um, unintentionally violated someone's consent. Um, and they, as soon as they realised that they were violating someone's consent, they, they stopped what they were doing and um, instantly became tried to make themselves accountable for that and, and and that that situation is being resolved between those individuals um but the one of the things that that person said to me at the time was am i a monster and i think that that is a really great illustration of someone being in shame and all you can do in shame is either turn in on yourself and go i am an i am a bad person and and get stuck there or come out fighting and go no I'm not you're blaming me for something that's not fair it's unjust I'm not that and I don't I don't feel that when you're in shame or you're being shamed or you're you're you, you, that once you start to hold yourself accountable then you can change your behavior and try to resolve the the damage and harm that you've caused and that's the only responsible and just thing to do I think it's my opinion anyway. Um. <laughs> I completely agree with you Jenny I think that in like just using that that example that you gave I think that when you are feeling shame it becomes about you and when you're feeling accountable it becomes about the other person I think that it you know that shame is is a very selfish sort of 
to me, sort of like narcissistic. I'm worried about myself. I'm not worried about the other person in it. Yeah. Whereas accountability, I think, is like I'm standing up for the thing that I've done to another person. Um, uh, I'm going to get to another question that's come in on the chat to me. Is there any research or interventions anyone would like to see in the future? Oh, wow. I mean, I, you know, what's what I know you've just finished your PhD, Lauren. What's next for you? What, um, Cheska, when you I know you're quite near the beginning of your research, really. But but what next? And Tamara, I know you've got lots of ideas and projects on the go. So any kind of research or interventions that you, you're particularly looking forward to? in the future or hoping might happen. Are you gonna go, Tamara? You look like you're sort of raring to go. I was gonna say that we we're involved in in a in a project that's sort of I don't know if, if Chaska you would like to talk about this more because it's sort of more closely related to your PhD. Um, um which I'm looking forward to. So it's it's around sort of online sperm donation. Um I I'm I want to see more research that sort of celebrates the things that are being done really well um mm -hmm. <laughs> i'm really interested in sort of projects that are around um you know intersectional friendships how can we learn about like those relationships and 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 how how do people sort of share their experiences and grow together um sort of moving away from just sort of consent within sex sort of yeah what what does consent look like within friendships that are you know people from different backgrounds what does consent look like in in um families and parenting and and at work for example so yeah that's mine i i just to responding again to the, a bit to that i think that um that we it, it, we culturally <laughs> Uh, we treat sex as something that's special and unique and very different from mm. everyone else. And often, um, when I'm when people are challenging me on areas of work that I'm doing, if I can just, uh, especially around consent, if I can just take them outside of sex and provide a mm. parallel example, um, like you know, consent at the dentist or. <laughs> those kinds of things then suddenly people go oh right yeah yes. yeah yeah um, it's because it's i think it's still just because we're so sex is still taboo so talking about consent in the context of sex feels different because we don't know how to talk about sex we know how to talk about our fears of the dentist and <laughs> our fears of having to go in a mri scanner or whatever it is but like we don't talk about sex so yeah. No, and I think also the idea of consent mostly has been sexualized. You know, mm. people think of sexual consent and then it almost becomes a dirty word in some contexts. You know, when, when there was a conversation around, well, what should relationships and sex education in schools look like? And you know, people were saying, oh, you can't possibly teach that to primary school children, mm. a, you know, people who are under 11 years of age. And it's like, well, it's all about it being appropriate to the age but of course you can introduce those concepts why can't you introduce the idea of consenting to something just mm -hmm. as you were talking about Lauren yeah. uh, it doesn't have to be sexual consent um you know so that people understand the concept of consent and how that might apply to their lives then mm -hmm. and then later that can be related to um sexual forms of consent so sorry yeah, I was going back to the, our question, research interventions, anyone in the future, did, it, did either of the other, other of you have any, any burning, I want to research this? I don't Lauren, think... Lauren, you have got little so, ideas, sorry. Yeah, no. <laughs> I've been keeping a diary during my PhD of all of the projects I want to do, so I've got yeah. quite a long list at this point. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I have a list too. I, I use the um, the app Evernote, oh. and um, and I, I have a page of like research ideas, things that might be good for dissertation students, things research students might be interested in. You know. yeah, always lots of projects. I think um, for me though, it's perhaps not so much about the topic right now. Um, I think just about the way in which we do the research, which perhaps uh, harks back to what Cheska was saying earlier. I think it's um, really important to think about how we can do research 
that is sensitive to and working alongside the people that we are interested in researching and their experiences um, and trying to include them in that research process as much as possible and be guided by um, their needs. Mm. So I think that's really important. Uh, and also, I think the importance of doing research that you feel will really make a difference. Um, I think to me, that's a really important thing. Um, so believing to do research, not for the sake of it um, or because it's solely because it's interesting, although that can be a good enough reason, um, but also because hopefully it will make people's lives better. Um, and maybe it's in some way contribute to bringing about some kind of social change. And I think for me, that's a really important part of research. Great. Um, we're, we're running out of time and I've just got one, one, that's a really great place to sort of begin winding up. Um, was, there's another question on the chat, which was, is also a good wind up question, which is where do you publish your research? Is there a journal focused on these topics? Where can, people who are listening to this find out more about the work that the Shush Group and, and you are doing? For so. me at the moment, is the answer is nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> no, nowhere wants to accept my work. Um, so I'll leave it to you. I, it, yeah, it's so uh, it's not as easy a question as it sounds. I mean, we've talked about the different ways in which stigma can impact on our work, and uh, trying to publish it is sometimes one of those things. Mm. Um, one of the things that we've talked about as a group before, as well, is uh, sometimes the places that are easiest to publish in are not necessarily the places that you want to publish in, and uh, it, it and not not because they're not worthy places and valuable places uh, to share your work but because each journal has its own audience and uh, sometimes you feel like you might be uh, preaching to the converted in your chosen journal so sometimes you want to maybe publish your work in a different journal that's maybe a little bit more mainstream but would reach a different audience and hopefully maybe encourage them or invite them to think differently about that issue uh, but of course, you can imagine it's much more of a challenge to get your work into those kinds of journals. Um, so perhaps not always the best place to start. Uh, but there is definitely um, journals that uh, you know accept this kind of work. Sexualities is one of them, for example. Archives of Sexual Behaviour, Journal of Sex Research, um, or uh, something like Journal of Sexual Aggression, if you're interested in sexual harm, for example, or uh, trauma violence and abuse. So there are um, journals that are open to this kind of work um, but it, I think it's worth bearing in mind that each journal has its own audience. Mm. I once got told that my paper on sexual consent was too niche for a health journal <laughs> which I thought was yeah interesting. <laughs> uh, uh, you do guys have a have a twitter account of course don't you as, a, as the shish group so um, perhaps um, we could get a tweet out maybe mentioning some of the journals that you've you've listed and sharing um this um recording when i've when i've got it up online in a shareable state uh via that what, what can you remind me what the twitter handle is somebody i've forgotten uh at shush underscore research i think yeah so at sssh underscore research if you want to try and find the group on twitter and uh, share your thoughts with them there. Um, I'm going to stop the recording now. Uh, just before I do, I'm going to say thank you to Tamara, Tesca, Lauren, and the rest of the Shush group that have contributed to the, the planning of this session. And thanks to everyone that's joined us on the Zoom. Um, I'm just going to stop this recording now.